is there a way to send intravesical BCG to the ureter or kidney for high-grade cancer? So hi, this is Dr. Lenahan. So there are two ways you can try to give BCG to the kidney or the ureter. Again, you'll run into some of the similar problems is that because it's a liquid, it's very difficult to keep it in one place for treatment of tumors within the kidney or tumors within the ureter. So you can put a stent in, which is a tube that goes from the bladder up to the kidney, and you can put the BCG into the bladder. And that tube can allow the BCG to go back up into the kidney and try to treat the tumor. But again, if you want to get it all the way up into the kidney and you want to have the BCG sit in where the actual tumor is, it's very difficult. In some cases, I've also had to put a tube through the back into the kidney called a nephrostomy tube. And in those cases, you can do some very slow infusions of the BCG where you're running it through the tube in the back into the kidney. But again, there's always the problem with tumors in the kidney or the ureter of being able to baste the tumor essentially in the BCG. Ahmad, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, that was well said. I think there's, you know, in the past I used to put a stent in the ureter and uh, infuse the bladder with BCG with some uh, limited studies, especially in animal models and some experience. Um, I switch now to actually bringing the patients to the office every week for six weeks in a row and doing exactly what we do for the mitogel clinical trial where I actually pass a stent, a catheter from outside the patient all the way to the pelvis and then slowly drip the BCG. And I think that's probably give the tumor more exposure to the, uh, you know, chemotherapy. But again, you know, the results are mixed for that. One of the things that I think that both uh, of our speakers uh, emphasized is slowly. BCG is an organism that's alive. And uh, while it's been altered to decrease its infectious uh, capabilities, if BCG gets into your bloodstream, it can cause a serious even potentially life-threatening infection. And one of the concerns about putting BCG into the upper urinary tract, in addition to not being sure that it's actually getting to where it needs to go and staying there to be absorbed, but that it can get into the uh, bloodstream uh, of, of the ureter or of the kidney. And if it does, you can have a significant uh, infection. So I think that, that um, for the patients out there that are uh, looking for uh, types of treatments for uh, uh, upper tract disease, including uh, medications, that is a real true unmet need, and that's what, what the, uh, the whole basis of, of the Mitogel program, as well as using uh, potentially stents with drugs in, in them that can slowly uh, uh, be delivered to the tumor, that's, that's really uh, a, a major focus for, for the uh, for for the bladder cancer and neurologic urothelial cancer community. Should patients suspected of upper tract disease see a regular urologist or a urothelial specialist? And how would they identify somebody who really knows how to treat this rarer form of bladder cancer? Well, I, I suppose it would be a little self-serving to say that uh, patients should always see, you know, an expert in uh, uh, urothelial cancer. But to be honest with you, I think most um, of, uh, of our residents from, from all of our programs are trained certainly in the, uh, you know, state-of-the-art ureteroscopy, uh, which means being able to pass a tube up and get direct vision and do biopsies. I think it gets a little complicated uh, when, um, say, a patient is having frequent recurrences or uh, certainly high-grade disease or difficulty in making a diagnosis. And I think that's where 
we would certainly encourage the, the community urologist to reach out to um, you know the uh, an expert in uh, say a medical center close to them um, there's going to be in virtually every uh, 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 certainly major city and, and most states access to someone with uh, a higher level of expertise. Um, and then of course, uh, just maybe to put a plug in for Beacon, for the listeners, that um, you know, Beacon is an excellent source of, um, you know, when someone is looking for an expert in their community to identify uh, someone uh, in the you know, any of us, you know, we, a number of, you know, we've got a large scientific advisory board, uh, and Beacon really has their, ha knows sort of who the experts are in, in all of the communities. So that's a good resource if, if someone's looking for uh, an expert. So, I do have a question on genetic tests. Are there any particular genetic tests available for upper tract? In particular, what testing is available for Lynch syndrome? One of our participants, her mother, both have been diagnosed with upper tract disease. So how would they find out about Lynch syndrome? You had mentioned that earlier. Yeah, so if I may, um, I think you know Dr. Mateen is, is the perfect person to answer that question. He's done some really extraordinary research uh, in the last year or two, uh, and, you know, testing this in a, co a continuous group of patients. I think, Serena, it was over 100, maybe 150, um, and has really kind of worked out the, the sort of ideal testing strategy. And so uh, I think we're very fortunate to have him on the webinar today. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to speak about that. Um, there's been that, uh, some laboratory and database studies that suggested that there's a fair amount of undiagnosed Lynch patients and uh, who, who present with upper tri cancer. That had never really been um, uh, sort of evaluated in the, in the clinical setting with, if you will, you know, uh, living, breathing patients. So several years ago, we started screening every single upper tract patient that was coming through uh, my clinic, and I do see about uh, the overwhelming majority of, of these cases that come through our center. And what we actually found uh, was a roughly 6% uh, case of confirmed previously undiagnosed Lynch syndrome in patients who present with upper tract cancer and about a 14% rate of possible Lynch syndrome, and it's possible because those were not uh, confirmed by genetic uh, germline testing. Uh, what we found in the process of this is that there's two tests that seem to capture all of these cases. Uh, one is called the Amsterdam 2 criteria, and quite honestly, it's, it's basically a good history uh, from the patient and as well as their family history. So particularly family history of colon cancer, endometrial cancer, skin cancers, um, any other form of gastrointestinal cancer like esophageal or stomach, for example. And then there's a few others that are not quite as strongly associated but could be, such as uh, ovarian, breast, um, and uh, prostate and kidney cancer. So what that's one is just basically getting a good history and seeing if uh, the patient's history and their family history fits a particular pattern of what we call a 3 to one three successive generations, um, uh, two of them being primarily related, and one of them having been diagnosed before the age of 50, particularly if it was colon or uh, endometrial cancer. <clears throat> the second test that we found captured uh, along with the history uh, every patient is it actually a test that already exists at uh, pretty much every center, and this is a test of the tumor tissues called immunohistochemistry, and this is the ability to stain with specific markers these tumor tissues. And so there's four proteins that they can test for, um, and uh, they're already available because this is something that already is done or should be done routinely on colon cancer cases and as well endometrial cases. And so uh, uh, physicians can request for their upper tract 
tumors to have this uh, staining done. And if by chance one of those four proteins does not show up in the tumor, that suggests the possibility of Lynch syndrome and would justify sending the patient to um, a genetic counselor to have confirmatory testing. Um, the, that answers, I think, only part of the question, which is, uh, you know, could the patient have Lynch syndrome? Um, and the second one is, what happens if you see a patient with diagnosed Lynch for tract disease? You know, this is an area where we're still learning a lot. Um, we have a lot more to learn. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that on the panel, there's probably a lot of uh, experience uh, with this, and it's something that I think we need to just keep, um, uh, you know, keep learning about over time. Me last question. In, uh, we talked earlier about the descending and ascending tumors. In a descending tumor that's spread from an upper tract tumor into the bladder, is the latter tumor considered to have arisen spontaneously due to a field effect, or is it thought of as an implant that has broken off the upstream lesion? Are they genetically homogenous? Are they the same? Or um, do ascending tumor lesions arise? They flow upstream. How does this happen? You talked about this earlier. So one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, a pathologist by the name of Scott Tomlins, who does a lot of genomic sequencing, what we did, and we published this paper a few years ago, is sequence tumors in patients who had multifocal disease throughout their entire urinary tract. And the take-home message is that what they found, or what he found um, doing the profiling is that both are true that some of the tumors within the urinary tract are cousins of each other, meaning that they share the same genomic signature or DNA signature, and some of them are uh, different. You know, they're not they're not from the same family. Um, we we often you know think that tumors that are arising in the upper urinary tract um, drop tumor down into the bladder. And oftentimes what you see in patients who we've removed their kidney and ureter from, they have roughly about a 25 or 30 percent chance of recurrence in their bladder that we often see within three to six months after surgery. So that certainly would suggest that um, there is a seeding of the urinary tract, um, but, but likely you know, because of prior exposures that patients have had or underlying genetic abnormalities, um, there's likely both at play. And um, ultimately, you know, it just requires us as urologists and, and as patients to keep a very close uh, eye on people's urinary tract. One thing that we do try to do in patients who uh, um, are undergoing surgery to have their kidney and ureter removed. Um, there is uh, level one evidence. I mean, it could be arguable, but there is level one evidence to support instilling a single dose of chemotherapy into the bladder uh, around the time of the surgery to try and reduce the risk of people developing tumors within their bladder afterwards. And it does seem to reduce the risk, although. There is obviously some risk of putting chemotherapy in the bladder around the time of the procedure. I'd like to thank everybody. This was a wonderful panel. And Dr. Steinberg, thank you so much for being the guide through upper tract disease and helping us to understand it. This is the first time we've ever really addressed this in the webinar format. And I really appreciate everyone's input here. You guys did a wonderful job.